Okay, what's the number one reason you should try Instacart? Shopping over 1.5 million unique products from over 1,000 retailers and get everything delivered right to your door in as fast as one hour, all in one app. So you can spend more time with the ones who matter most. Visit instacart.com to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. $10 minimum per order. Additional terms apply. This is Sports Daily on Wichita's number one sports radio, 97.5 and 1240 KFH. All right, welcome back in, everybody. Sports Daily here on KFH. Uh, shout out to Hubby's Helmets on Twitter. Um, I think I showed this, Tommy. He, I know he's looking right now. But check this out. We got Cowboys on one side. Sports Radio KFH. Matches the logo up there. Pretty cool, right? I mean, Pretty you're cool. just, it's salt in the wound right now. I mean, you, you showed it one other time. You know, I, I mentioned I didn't get one. Um, and now you're showing it again. Like, you're just rubbing it in. Listen, I, I just know that uh, the great listener, viewer who sent that is currently watching. So I had to appropriately say thank you. That's all it is. Uh, no, no offense there. No offense there. Um, all right, so Wichita State baseball gets started in the conference tournament today. Um, it will happen Scheduled for 6.30. We'll see what time. They do have a natural break, so I don't think it'll get a push tremendous amount if it gets pushed. By the way, you'll hear it. Uh, pre-game coverage beginning at 6.10 tonight. Um, so conference awards come out. Brock Rodden gets American Athletic Conference Player of the Year. He was the preseason player of the year. Um, cool stuff there. And Lauren Hibbs gets named Coach of the Year. Congratulations to Lauren Hibbs on that honor. I think we would all say that this year has gone better than most expected. And, and you know, it started off with some turmoil, with some turbulence when Eric Wedge was let go. So Lauren Hibbs comes in, all the experience he has. We've asked Kevin Saul this directly. We don't know the answer to this. Wouldn't expect Kevin Saul to give us an exact answer on this. But Lauren Hibbs' future is interesting. Um, it's uh, it, It's, you know... He's coach of the year now, and you, there are such obvious parallels to the situation Wichita State was in with Isaac Brown. And I am still an advocate of Wichita State making the proper decision there with Isaac Brown. Uh, it did not work out for whatever reason, and now Wichita State has moved on. Basketball and baseball are not the same thing. Let's not pretend like they are. And... This is an interesting scenario. And what I don't know on this, and and there's no way to find this out. We'll see. Time will tell. Is if Lauren Hibbs wants this job long term. But, you know, there are decisions that have to be made that will be really interesting. And, you know, you have to have, and we have not. Like, I haven't talked to the players about this kind of stuff. Like, there are conversations that have to happen and, and you go through in these situations. What I do know is I've never heard one person ever publicly, behind the scenes, whatever, that hasn't said very positive things about Lorne Hibbs, kind of person he is, kind of coach he is, whatever. Everybody, including his former bosses, have called him such basically a blessing to have that experience on the bench there at Wichita State. So he wins Coach of the Year in the conference. I would say, Tommy, you know, without, you know, because it's like, again, the level and the depth of knowledge on that process in that search is not high enough for me so just at the surface right he's a Kansas guy he's a Wichita State alum and I would say that it makes a lot of sense right yeah if he wants the job give him the job I mean I I really honestly feel that way and and you know I had a conversation on Twitter yesterday about that after he was named uh, the American Conference Coach of the Year Um, you know where I think that there is a little bit of PTSD after the Isaac Brown situation, right? You know, and, and this thought of, um, you know, hey, maybe uh, it'd be good to do a, a national search for a new coach. 
Okay, well, it's kind of apples and oranges because Lauren Hibbs has 30 years of head coaching experience right. prior yeah. to this job, where Isaac Brown didn't have any. So you, I, I understand the fear there. I understand the hesitation there from the Shocker fan base because it you know, seems like history is repeating itself a little bit, where you've got an interim coach doing an incredible job. The team rallies around that person. They go to the postseason, you know, and, and then you think, okay, well, you know, it just makes sense to give him the job permanently. It is a different situation. Lauren Hibbs has so many more qualifications than Isaac Brown ever had on the basketball court. So I, I think that at that point you can separate, you know, those two situations because they're not similar, you know, at all. And so I really feel like if Lauren Hibbs has the desire to coach full time permanently, I think you go ahead and give him the job. I do think they're similar in some ways. I think they're similar in that they stabilized a program in some turmoil. I think that both of those men took over a program when the head man was let go in some controversy. Um, I think that that matters, and I think that that's similar. What I don't know, and by the way, I, I again, I don't, I'm not, I don't think it was in wildly unsuccessful tenure or anything for Isaac Brown. No. I think he did a fine job. I, I think no. it was borderline on whether he should have the job or not. Like, it was close. I think what ultimately cost Isaac Brown was everything off the court and, you know, some of the things that go into being a head coach at a major university and as far as, you know, the NIL world and recruiting and all that kind of stuff. That's where – because Lauren Hibbs hasn't been a coach during that, a head coach. And I and that's the part, again, I don't know. Like, I, that's – that's what makes it tricky, right? If we're just talking about how he did with a group of players this year and taking over a rocky situation, soaring. A-plus, passes with flying yep. colors, boom. But that's not everything. And that's what we learned with the Isaac Brown situation. It's not all about what he did this year with those players. Can he, can, can he recruit at the level of the players that are there currently? That'd be my top question, right? I we don't know the answer. We he don't did know it for the 30 years. to that. It's a different world. What he did what he did for 30 years is not the same as what happens now. It's just not. Just like Isaac Brown. Recruiting when Isaac Brown was coming up is not the same now as it was when it was you could just go find the best players and coach them. It's more than that now. I mean, that's that's the world we live in. So that's what makes it like I'm trying to like learn lessons in all this of like, you know, if if somebody's there that is more qualified. I would imagine that Wichita State feels a greater obligation now to entertain. Like, let's just, and again, I don't, I'm not saying this is true. I have no inside information. This is absolutely a hypothetical situation. Please accept this disclaimer. But let's say Kevin Hooper was interested in the job. You don't think they ought to talk to Kevin Hooper? I think that Kevin Hooper definitely has, you know, qualifications to be, the head coach for Wichita State baseball, but I'm not convinced that he's a better option than what they currently have on the bench right now. I mean, th let me lay out this situation here in this way. You do a nationwide search, let's say, and you're, you're trying to find a head coach nationally that has the, the accolades, that has the experience, that has the years of developing talent, on-field coaching, all of that. You want to tell me that there are more qualified candidates out there than Lauren Hibbs? Because I'm not sure that there is that would be interested in going and coaching at Wichita State. What I don't want to have happen is I don't want Wichita State to cut off their nose to spite their face because of what happened with basketball and I say, you know what, we're, we're just we're not going to we're not even going to consider Lauren Hibbs because we learned our lesson with the Isaac yeah. Brown situation. We're going to go and look you know, nationally. They can't do that because they've got somebody. And you know what? I don't I don't know if it's Kevin Hooper. I don't know if there's somebody else that's out there, you know, that, you know, might be a better choice. I don't know that. But what I do know is that you have to be very careful because you've got somebody who is high quality, high class, high character, a damn good coach that's sitting on the bench right now that has led the Shockers to a third place seating in the American Conference Tournament when I don't think anybody thought that they would be at this point this season. No. I think that you you have to be able to balance it. You can't just go all in and say, Lauren Hibbs is the guy. I think you have to be thoughtful in that. But I also do think that you have to make sure that you're not potentially chasing away your best opportunity for a permanent head coach. I hope that nobody misunderstands this conversation, by the way. I, I, 
I root for Lauren Hibbs to get this job. I want everybody to know that. Just like at a at an observational level, I want Lauren Hibbs to get the job because I think he's earned it. But let's just say they lose their first two games in the conference tournament, Tommy. Uh, they're 30 and 25 on the year. 30 and 25. I mean, it's not like I, I, when when Isaac Brown got it, they won the league, right? And it was a weird year. Like, they, I, I am with you on this. Treat this totally separately. Even though Completely there is a similarity, situation. even though there is a similarity, you have to treat this differently. Number one, because college baseball and college basketball are two very different things. Um, and number two, because that's not fair to either guy, right? That's not fair to lump either situation in together because they're unique. I mean, they're unique. They are. Yeah, it's they're... not fair to Lauren Hibbs to judge him based on what happened with Isaac Brown, right? And it's not, it, yeah, and it's not fair to look at Isaac Brown's situation, I don't think, and say, oh, yep, that was the wrong decision because they didn't X, Y, Z. No, I think it was the right decision, okay? I, I, I think it was the right decision. So it didn't work out ultimately. But that doesn't make it the right. That doesn't not make or not make it the right decision in that very moment. They could have hired anybody that didn't do well. Like it, and it was Isaac Brown did well. Like he didn't not right. do well. I also it's, don't think that you can take their record. Uh, again, let's go back and say that they lose, you know, early and get bounced in the conference tourney, and they've got a thirty and twenty five record in the season. I don't think you can view that record in a bubble by itself, you know, and say, oh, you know, that's couple games over 500 we expect more we need a coach that can do more than that because I don't think that there were many people that thought that they would win 30 games this season with all the drama that happened before the season even started Eric Wedge out Lauren Hibbs in not sure how the team was going to respond to all of that so I think that it's you know I mean we were talking in what the middle to end of March about the Shockers in first place in the conference right you know, and so I think that those are things that all need to be taken into consideration. I don't think that you can just look at the overall final record as the end all be all of the reason why you should or shouldn't hire Lauren Hibbs. No, I don't either. They were picked fifth preseason in the league. Um, so I mean, take that for what it's worth. Not that preseason polls mean a whole lot, but you know, they were they were they exceeded the expectation for sure. I mean, at least they did for us. And just listen to Lauren Hibbs talk right. be around him at any point and you're impressed right like so the character is there so we know kevin saw values they won at a level i think that's absolutely acceptable this year he's an alum which matters greatly and he navigated a pretty tumultuous time the one p the only thing we don't know is the recruiting level i mean that's it that's all we do and, and maybe with conversations with players and other people Wichita State knows that and we don't, right? You could just talk to the players that are there and say, how much did Lauren Hibbs, you know, have to do with you coming here? Like, you can have conversations and figure that stuff out. But it is interesting. It's interesting to see that award come. And it was just like, ha -ha, that's awesome. Uh, good for him. But, man, that's we've been here before. It seems like, feels like a little bit. We'll see. Shockers play today. You'll hear him today. Uh, we think they've got a shot here, okay? They've They've – They've pitched enough, I think, in this season, and they have enough depth there and versatility that we think they've got a chance in this tournament. And and it doesn't always feel that way, so we're really, really excited about it. Good luck to the Shockers. Good luck to Lauren Hibbs and that entire team. And congrats, by the way, again to uh, Brock Rodden for basically living up to the hype. Preseason Player of the Year was named the Player of the Year. He was fantastic this year. Just just phenomenal player. Um by the way, that pregame coverage, again, starts at 610. All right, Tommy, let's jump back a little bit here before we switch topics. Let's go back to the NBA Finals because we were a little abbreviated there in the first hour in a topic that I do think is fascinating with the Lakers' future. Denver's future, right, is pretty simple. They were fantastic. Again, they've been fantastic all postseason long. They are finding all kinds of different ways to win games. They have the best player remaining in the playoffs, and Denver uh, will be favored no matter who they play most likely Miami, in that series. Uh, they have that final hurdle to jump, and we'll talk much more about them as we move forward because we'll have time. The Lakers, however, are interesting. It all hinders around LeBron James at the moment, who after the game last night, if you didn't hear it, seemed very unclear, uncertain of his future. And I don't think that's posturing. I don't think that's grandstanding. I think that was pretty raw honesty in a moment of... And it was the right time to ask that question, too, by the way. If anybody thinks, oh, you shouldn't ask him right after a loss, yes, you should. 
because that's when you're going to get the most real answer. You're going to get the most real answer when that wound of losing and being swept is the most raw because that's when I think you have the most questions about what you want to do. So absolutely. And I applaud LeBron James for answering it honestly too, by the way. I think he, I think he was very real with people like, man, I don't know. I don't know what to do right now. Because I think in that moment, and he said it, like it's winning championships. And it really does. It doesn't become a question of can LeBron still get it done? Of course he can. He's still one of the top 15, 10 players in the NBA. He's incredible at his age. It becomes a question to me of can the Lakers win a title next year? And then the question is going to be, does he want to try to play with his son? But we're not there yet. So for next year, it becomes a question of can the Lakers win a title? Can with this version of the Lakers, with LeBron and maybe Anthony Davis and Ham and some of these role players, I believe they'll have Austin Reeves another year. Uh, Hachimura seemed to be a bit of a revelation. And, and, and they did some really nice things with that roster. Can they add enough in an offseason to go get one? I think that they probably can. I think that they probably can. I don't know whether that's through going to find some free agents that might come in on the minimum. I don't know if LeBron and Anthony Davis still have that kind of sway, right? Like, can we really, at our advanced ages, convince big-time players to come here? That doesn't always work out anyway. Or if they simply just need to hit, right? You got to hit in the draft. You got to hit in free agency with young players, maybe that people don't really know about, just like they did at the trade deadline. Is that enough to surpass Denver? Yeah, I think it probably is. They played all four of those games ultra tight. I'll believe it when I see it. I mean, I think that they've well, yeah, got, sure. you know, they've got this opportunity in place to be able to do that. I just don't know. I don't know who those pieces are, you know, and you've like, there, there are names that stand out to me as game changers that can be added onto any team and they immediately become credible. They immediately become teams that you look at like, okay, well, that's, that is going to change the overall trajectory of whatever team that they join. I don't know if any of those players are going to be joining the Lakers, you know? So I, I think that it would have to be something where like, to your point, I don't disagree with you where maybe it's a little bit more of a, a younger guy that is ready to take the next step that can then, you know, contribute in a certain way. I just wonder how well, young talent ready to make the next step in their career and, you know, go forward and elevate their career will mesh with LeBron and Anthony Davis. I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, is there a scenario where the Lakers can add enough pieces as to where LeBron doesn't have to be the focal point? And I don't know. I don't know if LeBron wants to be the focal point or feels like he has to be the focal point. So I don't exactly know what that direction is, but it's going to make for a really an interesting off season as far as, because I, I think you and I are both in agreement. He's coming back. Like he's going to play next season. I don't have any doubt in my mind, you know, on that. I just wonder what can the Lakers do to be able to get them over the hump? Because right now Denver is showing themselves as absolutely dominant in the West. And I don't know if little additions here and there or little changes here and there with the Lakers will be enough to get them over the hump with the amount of talent that Denver has, or if it's going to take a little bit more of a, a bigger change in the roster makeup for the Lakers for them to be able to get over that hump. I don't think they can afford a bigger change. No, I don't think LeBron has to be the centerpiece, but I think he's good enough to be if that's what they need. Um, I, I don't think they can like blow it up and do it. I think it is like this and what can they add to it. And yeah, right. it's a question. I mean, it is a question, but I think it's possible. And if you're LeBron trying to make that decision, that's really all that matters in the decision, right? Is is it possible? Would it be possible for us to win a title next year? Because if it's not, and I, I totally get it. If I'm him at you know his ability and what he's accomplished and done, if I'm not winning a championship next year, I have absolutely no interest in going through this grind at 38 years old and I want to just go be a dad. Like I get that and totally respect it and agree with it, quite frankly. Um, it's it's championship or bust. I mean, that's all it is. They didn't get it last night. He's clearly upset. He's giving you an honest answer. Let's see what it is. Can they? I think that they can. I think they got to probably get it pretty close to perfect this offseason to do it, and then they've got to have good fortune with health. I'd put Anthony Davis on ice, right, and, and just sort of try to navigate through. Miami is showing us, and the Lakers to some degree. I think they're different, but Miami's showing us you can kind of 
coast it in the regular season. As long as the NBA continues to accept that as as a thing, which I think is a problem for the league, but you know, whatever, it works, then yeah, they have a chance. They got to get it right in the offseason. And I don't know what they're working with. I have no idea. But they got to get it right. But yes, I think there's still enough left in LeBron James and Anthony Davis to make another run. And then after next offseason when he's a free agent, then he can make the decision based on his kid. It come, it becomes much easier. Or he can say, you know what, enough of this. I just want to watch my kids play basketball. I'm tired of this. I don't want to do it anymore. I, it's a lifestyle I couldn't, I mean, 20 years, being on the road that much, when the spotlight's always on you, and you, like, LeBron's never going to be able to just go play basketball, right? Anytime there's anything interesting happening, he's going to get asked about it. He's Whether he wants to be or not, he's a mouthpiece for the league. I think that he has probably learned some hard lessons in that over his career where, you know, taking stances and making proclamations isn't as simple as it seems because you're always going to make somebody angry, even if that's not your intention. He's he he's had to live that his entire career for 20 years. That's exhausting. He doesn't need that. I mean, he's he's into movies now, like his kids are great at basketball, all this stuff. Like he doesn't need that stuff. It's really about winning championships and, like, the nostalgia of everything. So we'll see. It'll be interesting uh, to see what LeBron James does. I think he'll be back. I think he'll come back. I think he'll play next year, and I think the Lakers will be pretty competitive. Um, what do you think? 869-1240 is the number to call. You can also leave us your comments on our video stream. We've got a couple of people chiming in there as well. Uh, always appreciate that conversation. Hunter Dozier is out, and the OTAs have started. A couple more things to get through here. Today on Sports Daily, we'll take a quick break. We'll come right back. We'll get it done. Turn a loss into a win with BetMGM, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Place a one-game parlay wager with at least four legs on any MLB game. If all legs of the parlay hit but one, you'll get your stake back in bonus bets up to $25. Just log into your account, download the app, and sign up with BetMGM to get started. Then opt into the one-game parlay insurance promotion to receive up to $25 back in bonus bets. If your parlay with four legs or more loses, buy just one leg. Only at BetMGM, the best place to bet on baseball. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. Kansas only, new and existing customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as is non-withdrawable bonus bets. Bonus bets expire seven days from issuance. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Uh, Major League Baseball in full swing. The Royals make their first critical decision of the year. Uh, not an easy one, I'm certain, for them to make. But Hunter Dozier designated for assignment, Tommy. Good. Good. It needed to be done. It needed to be done. I mean, you know, Hunter Dozier, um, I'm sure he's a nice guy. <laughs> I don't know him. Uh, but, man, he was garbage. Absolute garbage. And, and you know, his slash line. Just so you know, ever since Hunter Dozier signed his contract back in 2020, his slash line, 228, 344, 392. Uh, and he had a 27% strikeout rate. I mean, you know, 27% of the time going up to the plate and striking out. Um, and you would think, okay, well, maybe he's not a great hitter, but, you know, if he could back it up defensively, you know, maybe there can be value there. Nope, didn't really back it up defensively either. Uh, played first base, third base, right field. Never really was an incredible defender. And so while it's a tough decision for the Royals, you know, they kept trotting him out there. I think hoping that, you know, he would live up to that contract. Never did. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it's a tough decision. Nobody's going to claim him on waivers because, you know, he makes so much money. So, you know, I, I think that the Royals, I mean, I think it's pretty clear they're willing to pay him to not play for them. If that tells you anything about the way that, you know, his career has gone with Kansas City. The year before that contract was signed, 26 home runs, hit 279. Yeah. Uh, you know, struck out, still struck out too much. But, you know, the defensive versatility, while, you know, not like gold glove caliber, the versatility is handy. 
Like it wasn't an outrageous contract based on that year's performance. And there really wasn't, you know, he had the injury early on. So there wasn't a huge track record. He had the season before where things didn't go very well. And then, and then it regressed back to more of that all the way through. It's tough. The Royals, we hammer them for not spending any money. And then when they do, people get annoyed at it. And it's because they haven't done it well. Like I'm not saying that's unwarranted. But, you know, you go back to a lot of the Alex Gordon mega contract when they gave it to him. He didn't live up to that. Um, you know, this one, you can look at Whit Merrifield. A lot of people had a problem with that, not trading him. You know, I, I think with Dozier, what what were they supposed to do? Just let him walk to free agency? I mean, I, that yes. The answer to that, by the way, is yeah. yes. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, that's the answer. Uh, now, though, in retrospect, I'm saying at the time, Right, you don't have a lot going for you. You've got this homegrown player who just had an incredible year, um, and then and it's not like the deal was just absurdly large, right? But it, by the royal standard, it sort of is, right? Like when you don't have, you know, all the money in the world, clearly, a four-year, twenty-five million dollar deal. Like everyone's talking about this horrible, co- like oh my god, this is just awful, this is terrible contract. It was no, a four-year, twenty-five million dollar deal. Like it yeah, was fine. I don't blame. I don't blame the Royals for this. I mean, you know, they felt like based on what Dozier did in twenty nineteen and twenty twenty that he was worth this contract. And it's Hunter Dozier. He didn't live up to it. I mean, I mentioned his slash line overall during his tenure with the Royals. By the way, his slash line this season in ninety one plate appearances: one eighty three, two fifty three, three oh five, and a career worse. 32% strikeout rate. The dude was striking out a third of the time he was coming to bat. And so, you know, in a season where the Royals have been incredibly up and down offensively, really the main player that was down and stayed down is Hunter Dozier. And so you've got Nicky Lopez coming off the injured list. You have to make a space for him. I'd rather have Nicky Lopez and his defense then Hunter Dozier going to the plate and striking out one in every three times. They just haven't been able to get it right on contracts or, or really anything like for a while. And again, four year, $25 million deals. If Dozier repeats the performance, it looks like a fantastic signing, right? But it didn't. And, and so it's not that, and, and I don't think that that money has hamstrung them by any means, but what it did for two years that's annoyed people is it's blocked other players. That's what they're doing now. They're, they're eliminating that. It, it, and I don't know, like, I don't, I wish I had some better news for you, Royals fans. Like it, it stinks that that didn't work out because he was a fun player to watch that year. He was awesome. And, and you root for the guys that come up through your system. Of course you do. And it didn't work. And that's just you know, now the key is, okay, who steps into that spot and what are the long-term pieces? I, I honestly, outside of Bobby Witt Jr., I don't know what the long-term pieces are. I like Nicky Lopez. I think he's handy. Um, I'd like to see him stick around, but there just aren't many. Um, and and it just continues to look more and more like, and they're going to have to totally redo this thing again. And I don't, you know, outside of spending a bunch of money in free agency, there's really no way around it. But let's not get mad at the Royals for spending money, though. Because a no. four-year, $25 million deal doesn't even sniff what it would take to get even a mediocre free agent um, with the current economics of baseball to get a truly impactful player. You're going to spend like $25 million in one year uh, pretty much. So right. it's and just I think the that finances they knew, are what they are. I think that they knew after the season that Dozier had when he hit the 26 home runs and all of that in 2019, I think they had this thought of, Okay, we know he's got some power in his bat. We know he strikes out too much. And so that's going to drive his value down. You know, so we can get him, you know, a power bat in their minds at the time, a power bat that, yeah, he's never going to hit for average. He's going to strike out too much. He's mediocre defensively, but he's got some pop in his bat. If we can work on the strikeouts a little bit, four years, $25 million, that seems to be a pretty good investment. So at the time... And I remember thinking when they signed him, okay, I don't have an issue with this contract. You know, he strikes out too much, but at least they've got some power, you know, in his bat. And remember at the time, they also had guys like Jorge Soler and and Salvi and other guys that could hit home runs and Dozier kind of fit, you know, in that category as well. He was never able to get the strikeout thing 
taken care of or improved and the power in his bat dipped as well in those 91 plate appearances this season, two home runs, you know, so, and, and he was never able to, you know, replicate what he did in 2019. And so that's not, in my opinion, on the shoulders of the Royals necessarily. You would have liked to see maybe the coaching try to find ways, and I'm sure that they did try to find ways in improving that, you know, the hitting coach and all of that, trying to improve, you know, all of that. But ultimately, I think that's on Dozier's shoulders. Well, of course it is. It is. And the Royals just have to move on and and continue to try to, you know, develop players from within for a minute. And we'll see as they have ballpark talks, when is the point where they just have to go invest outside the organization to try and make it better with, you know, somebody more, you know, exciting than Fran Mill Reyes, right? Like it's, you're right. just going to have to. Or we'll Carlos to... Santana last season. Like yeah, let, let's Santana actually. Was handy. He brought back, he brought back some trade value. I won't totally discount that. There is some value in bringing those guys in, hoping they get hot and trading them. I do think that's not a bad, but you gotta, but you gotta get it right in the trades. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's the thing. Like it's, you know, the evaluational tools have not been uh, at a premium in recent years, and we'll see. But Hunter Dozier, uh, just that just generation of Royals is gone. And there may be a lot of fans that are like, okay, like that needed to happen. So that did happen. That happened yesterday. 869-1240 is the number on the IHOP hotline for you. Let's give something away here, Jad. Let's uh, let's give away, I don't know, let's give away something to HTO. Let's do two iced tea cards. Two free iced teas. You can go west or east to HTO. Uh, go get a couple of those. Take a friend. We'll do that to our first caller, 869-1240 on the IHOP hotline. We're going to come back and talk about if there's anything we need to care about with the OTAs and the Chiefs and the NFL. We'll do it with Sports Daily Rolls for back in everybody congratulations to tyler from wichita on winning some hto iced tea east or west we've got two locations for you there that you can go check out and enjoy it on us go inside you can try all the flavors for free by the way you guys um, gotta be uh gearing up for a busy time of year right getting warmer outside yeah probably a lot so, of folks are going to be drinking some iced tea i would think when the sun comes out Things get very busy, and that's good. That's what we, you know, we're ready for that. Um, we're, we're, I, I like that time of year. Things move quickly. You know, we've got all kinds of fun stuff happening. There's some, you know, new, some new for, for those that are, and I didn't realize that this happened, Tommy. I think social media has something to do with this. Iced coffee is like a big deal now. You know, I, do, mm. I'm, I'm, one more reason why I'm, I'm an old soul. Like I drink black coffee in the morning. That's what I drink. And I drink, I do drink HDO black coffee. I get it in a bag and bring it home and make it. It's awesome. But iced coffee is the deal, right? It's it's the big deal. And we're, I think there's like five or six, there's a bunch of new iced coffee coming uh, on Memorial Day. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, uh, but it's coming on Memorial Day. So stay tuned for that. Uh, it'll be, it'll be cool. People that like iced coffee will like that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's ramping up. Sun comes out. We're in business. Um, All right. Let's, here's, here's my thing with OTAs. I don't really understand them. Like I, I don't I don't pretend to go through like, oh, they collectively bargained this and this is what they're allowed to do and blah 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 blah. Are the rookies there? Do we know that? I think so. I believe if so. If the rookies yeah. are there, I'm interested. Right? If they're there, I'm interested. Richie James is there, he's not a rookie, but like that's what I'm interested in at this point in off season workouts, because without contact, which there isn't in OTAs, they're voluntary. It's just like seven on seven, nine on seven, that kind of stuff. So even like the new offensive linemen or the new defensive linemen, it, whether they're free agents or draft picks, I'm like, eh, okay. Like about the only thing I'm interested in is Mahomes and his development with new receivers. That That's pretty much it for me. Like stay healthy and get, you know, some rapport with Patrick Mahomes going with new receivers in the room. What does that look like? Because otherwise I don't know that there's a lot they're going to get done right now. They don't have a lot that will change or a lot that will – you know, need seven on seven work, right? Maybe that's somebody, you know, a great football brain could could educate me on this. If we had Paul Savage here who's coached the the lines, he could let me know. But like non contact drills don't seem that beneficial to me for linemen. So um 
What is what is what do the receivers look like? That's about that's about it for me. I'm sure that there is a good amount of value that you know the the players find in OTAs and that the the coaches find in OTAs. I'm not sure there's a whole lot of value for what you and I do when it comes to talking about OTAs. Um, I think that once we get into training camp and then the preseason, yeah, then at that point the conversations start to ramp up some. But you know, right now I'm keeping, I don't know, kind of an eye on OTAs and the development. Like just if there's anything noteworthy coming out from Kansas City, then yeah, I'll read it and pay attention to it. But I like I just don't know if there's really a whole lot to be able to analyze right now, at least from our perspective on what the Chiefs are doing in OTAs. Who cares about anything but what we care about, though, you know? Like, why? if it's not important to us, like, who's... Who, hey, you, know? you said it, not me. Yeah. Uh, but you think it. Um, it it's, you know, it's, it's... it's it. I get it. Like, everything is theater in the NFL. Like, oh, look who's arrived. So-and-so arrives at OTAs. Yeah, all right. Like, I don't care. Uh, I just... I want to know who's going to help Patrick Mahomes at the wide receiver position this year, and then when we get to contact... And again, I, I would... I am sure that that coaching staff gets a tremendous amount of value out of OTAs. It's just hard yeah. to consume it. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's hard as a fan and I on see... May 23rd to be like, oh, let's right. look for this today. And whether it's in OTAs or in training camp or whatever it is, like going back to the receiver conversation, I want to see the development of Kadarius Tony. I want to see the development of Richie James. I want to see the development of Justin Ross, you know, who is somebody that the Chiefs have spoken highly of for a long time. And can he take that next step to be a viable receiver in the NFL? Those are things, and I don't know if they're going to be accomplished during OTAs, and we'll be able to have a good idea of that anytime soon, or if we're looking more at like the training camp path and, and at that time during the off season, when we can actually be able to break that down, analyze it and, and figure out, you know, exactly the way the wide receiver room is going to pan out. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with you. Like that's, that's the one training camp. I do think is very valuable. Like training camps different, I think, than OTAs. OTAs are just this confusing thing that we're, you know, it's like the filler between, and I know there's different phases of them now, but it's like this filler between the draft and training camp. Like, what could we get people excited for? We don't do this right. in other sports, right? Like, we don't, we don't like care about this stuff. It's, it's theater. It's constantly theater in the NFL. They do a it great reminds job of me trying a little to make bit, us care. Reminds me just a little bit of like the excitement in baseball when pitchers and catchers report, you know, like it's not spring training yet. <laughs> Right. But the pitchers and catchers report, and so it's like the next step in the off season. I think that's really what OTAs, you know, break down to for me. And you know, there are some other storylines around the NFL that are not OTA related. Like you know, the the owners are meeting with Roger Goodell, talking about rule changes and some of these other things that you know are being talked about and voted on. Austin Eckler looks like he's going to get a new contract to stay with the Chargers. I don't know if you saw this. Brandon McManus is being released by the Broncos, so they will be looking for a new kicker. You know, so there's a couple of other things that are floating around out there right now that aren't OTA related that are at least, you know, worthy of conversation in the NFL. So Eckler, uh, that's interesting. I hadn't seen that until you just said it. He basically yep. changed his mind and got a little bit of a raise. Good for him. Uh, you know, that's. I, I I feel for the running backs. I feel for the running backs. Their shelf life is short. I never have a problem with them, and they're trying to get as much as they can as fast as they can because they're quickly cast to the side anyway. So good for Austin Eckler. I, I like Probably that Probably better position. than hitting the open market, that's for sure. Yeah, he's going to hit the open market next season. Um, his will be an interesting – his will be interesting. I, I don't – I mean, this was probably best for him, I think. Um, and I don't know what he's making this year, but that's certainly um, not good news for the Chiefs. Austin Eckler will make the Chargers better. Um, there there are situations. Do we have, like, Dalvin Cook is out there as somebody who probably isn't going to be playing for the Vikings, we don't think. Um, so where might he go? Dallas Cowboys. Uh, what about Derrick Henry? Um, what, what is Derrick Henry going to do? As of now, right, he's still a Titan at the moment. Um but somebody will want Derrick Henry, wouldn't they? He'd be handy Where for a lot Ezekiel of teams. Where's Ezekiel Elliott going? Dallas Cowboys. Um, Zeke, I don't know. Zeke actually, 
Zeke and Derrick Henry, not not I'm not saying like I'm not trying to compare their careers, although I think they're both really good, really good, like maybe Hall of Fame caliber. Not sure Zeke is, but you know, when he was at his prime, he was definitely at that at that level. Derrick Henry for sure is. They're handy for somebody, right? Like Buffalo. You don't think either one of those teams could help Buffalo right now? You don't think either one of those teams could, or either one of those guys could help, quite frankly, the Chiefs right now? Uh, like there are good teams that could use those services well. I think. I'm very Dalvin Cook's a little bit different. Dalvin Cook, and maybe he's more like Derrick Henry than Zeke. Zeke feels like a free agent. I'm going to come in, and when you need me to gain three yards, I'm going to gain three yards. Like no matter what, that's what I'll do for you, which has value. Derrick Henry and Dalvin Cook probably still seen a little bit more as we could probably give these guys, you know, 20 carries a game type guys. So their their yeah. cases are interesting, but there are teams that need them. I mean, there are teams that need that on the roster. Don't you think that the longer that this drags out with wide receivers in general, because we haven't seen really any movement with free agent wide receiver or uh, running backs, I mean, uh, free agent running backs. Don't you think the longer that this drags on with the running back position that that is in favor of the teams, right? Like not the players. Like we're going to see later and later in the off season, these players are going to want to find a home. And if they're not being signed right away, you know, maybe they'll yeah, be maybe able to, the teams will be able to get more of a, dis- a discount on them. Desperation makes teams do things like, look, he, he, I'll put it to you this way. If Ronald Jones can continue to find jobs in the NFL, Zeke Elliott, Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, don't don't like let's not even have the conversation you know what i mean right like, and i know cost has something to do with it but if you're going to try and tell me none of those guys are still valuable in the league i just would counter with you've never watched football before like you're not actually watching football if you don't think those guys have value now what that value is is the source of debate right how much value is there in that but if we're going to try to have the conversation that those guys don't make football teams better, you, got, you just got to miss me with that conversation because I think it's I think it's insane. You know, what's the price tag? Fine. Let's have that conversation. But whether or not those guys make teams better, that's not even a conversation. Of course they do. Of course they do. I here. Let me put it to you this way. Two out of those three guys, I would take over Isaac Pacheco, Isaiah Pacheco right now. If all things were equal for this season, right, and you told me that the Chiefs could either give Isaiah Pacheco 20 carries a game or 20 touches a game or Dalvin Cook or Derrick Henry, I'm taking Dalvin Cook or Derrick Henry. Maybe not Zeke anymore, but I'm taking Dalvin Cook or Derrick Henry. Now, I get it. Cost is different, right? And that's the point. You know, that that is an important piece of yeah. this. But if we're just talking about ability, right, I'm taking those guys for this year 10 times out of 10. Well, yeah, I mean that like that's kind of a a, a non conversation, right? Because that's kind of like saying, yeah, I would take every Pro Bowl player based on ability to be on my team. I don't think you it's know, a cost be damned. Like there, there's I, I think more there that are goes into it. There are genuinely football people that have bought into this narrative that running backs aren't valuable. That would tell you that Isaiah Pacheco is the same thing. Like it provides the same value, and I think that that's crazy talk. Now. Cost relative, maybe, but but the, I'm telling you, there are people that just think like there are, you know, I don't know, there are people that think that these these incredible football players don't have any value in the NFL, and that's that's nuts to me. That think it's it doesn't matter who you put at that position, they'll all do the same thing basically, which is crazy. There are people that think that. So if these guys are, if you can get them and you can get them in and massage it in, because now at this point, like use what you've got in the cap. Like you don't, you, you've got it, use it. Bring one for contenders. Heck yeah. Now I wouldn't trade. Like what, what is, what do you got to trade for? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you a fifth round pick. If I've got to take that contract on, you right. take I'm the not contract up, on, I'll make it a third round yeah. pick. I'm not giving up valuable trade or uh, draft capital to bring in a Dalvin Cook right. or a Derrick right. Henry. But if there was a, Zeke a Elliott doesn't cost you anything. Situation. Right. Th- that might be a different story. Yeah, and I think all that stuff matters. And, and don't be surprised if some contenders add that way before it's all said and done. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back, tell you what's on tap today. Sports Daily. All Brock and Caster coming right back.
This is an important notice to all U.S. taxpayers. The IRS is giving...